traumatic brain injury uh, is a very important uh, subject which every anesthesiologist needs to know about. A uh, brain uh, which is uh, quite hungry uh, organ. Uh, for an organ which is roughly about 2% of the body weight. Which the monitoring and the thresholds that we're going to work on. The other very radiologically important parameter to look for to know the amount of phase density and need for surgery is the effacement of basal cells. I was lucky enough to be with the American Society of Anesthesiologists annual meeting at New Orleans on 21 to 25th of this year. As you all know, we have an academic link as well as a memorandum of understanding operating between us and the American Society of Anesthesiologists where we are invited every year for the meeting as well as they are invited to come out to India for our annual meeting. So this year for the annual meeting, I was forced to go to New Orleans. There's a big gathering, around 20,000 people were there for the meeting. And it was a fabulous conference. I may say it's a, such a show of conference was not seen on usual days. We had a meeting with the leaders of the ASA, I mean, American Society of Anesthesiologists. I had personal conversation with the American Society of Anesthesiologists present president, as well as outgoing president, and future vice presidents and president elects. And uh, well, we were able to discuss on the relation what we are having now. That means, well, we are in this to have some joint research as well as often academic support from them. I am thankful to you all for permitting me to go and present ourselves there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir for giving us a brief about uh, how what all happened at ASA. Uh, I welcome everybody to this uh, webinar on traumatic brain injury. Traumatic brain injury uh, is a very important uh, subject which every anesthesiologist needs to know about. And it's a subject which uh, you face every day. You get head injury patients regularly. And unfortunately, uh, some of us are not very well aware of how to manage different types of head injury. It's not that just head injury is uh, one thing. It's made, there are lots of uh, aspects which need to be known about head injuries and which should one should be aware of. And that is why we thought we should elaborate on this subject and talk about head injuries. But before we start this webinar, uh, I would like to share some MCQs uh, with all, the, all of the participants. And I would like to show some MCQs. Uh, and there are uh, multi-stem MCQs as they're called. And multi-stem MCQs, uh, you have to answer, you'll have to give the answers as uh, basically as true and false. So let's start with the uh, first one. The first one, the first question is regarding ICV management, which of the following are true or false? One, reduces in hospital mortality. Two, based on level one evidence. Three, indicated for GCS8 normal scan, or not indicated for GCS8 with normal CT scan. And five, is the mainstay for the treatment of TBI patients. So you have to answer these, each one of them as true or false. The second question is, regarding hyperosmolar therapy with mannitol for raised ICP, which of the following are true or false? Manitol recommended drug or fluid of choice. Second is manitol increases blood viscosity. Third is can increase brain tissue oxygen oxygenation. Fourth is should not be used in hypovolemic patients. And fifth is that the effective dose is 0.25 to 1 gram per kg body weight. Question three. Regarding hypertonic saline or raised ICP, which of the following are true or false? HTS, that is hypertonic saline, is the recommended drug of food of choice. Two, HTS causes a more intense and sustained reduction of ICP than an equimolar dose of mannitol. Three, HTS can increase brain tissue oxygen. Four, HTS is contraindicated with serum sodium 
145 millipills per liter and 5 reduces extracellular glutamate and prevents neuronal damage. The next question is, regarding diffuse axonal injury, which of the following are true or false? Decompressive craniectomy improves outcome as judged by GCS at, uh, GOS, sorry, at six months. Decompressive craniectomy improves survival as judged by GOS at six months. The severity of clinical symptoms is disproportionate to the radiological findings. DAIE has got both a primary and a secondary component and five traumatic microbleeds are radiological markers for DAI. The fifth question, regarding cerebral perfusion pressures, which of the following are true or false? One, the recommended value for survival is 60 to 70 millimeters of mercury. Two, the recommended value for a favorable outcome is 60 to 70 millimeters of mercury. Higher CPP is required in patients with impaired autoregulation. Four, optimal CPP needs to be tailored to individual patients. And five, ARDS is a concern with aggressive CPP target greater than 75 millimeters of mercury. The following questions will all be covered in today's webinars. And in the end, at the end of the webinar, we will be discussing, actually Dr. Gaurav Kakkar will be discussing the correct answers for each of these questions. So Gaurav, would you please share your slide? Oh, sorry, uh, Rahul, will you please share your slide? So we start off uh, the first topic and that is by Dr. Rahul. Dr. Rahul uh, J.S. Uh, is currently an assistant professor in neuroanesthesiology at my hospital that is Amrita School of Medicine and Amrita Hospitals, Faridabad. He has done his MD in anesthesiology from PGI Chandigarh. Thereafter, he did his DM in neuroanesthesiology and critical care for all the Institute of Medical Sciences. He's got special interest in neurocritical care, trauma care, difficult airway management, awake neurosurgery, ERAS in neurosurgical anesthesiology. And let me make you all aware that he has recently come back after making a presentation in the DAS National, uh, the International Conference at UK. Uh, over to Rahul. Rahul, please continue. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the kind words. Uh, it's good to be here and uh, good evening to one and all. I'm very sorry that this is not how, you, how I usually sound. Uh, it's, uh, I've been recently diagnosed uh, with a bout of uh, bacterial tonsillitis. <clears throat> so I'll try my best uh, to do, uh, to speak today, to be legible, as legible as possible. Uh, and also a word of warning that if I have a bout of cough in the middle, so please mind your ears. So thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I represent Amrita Hospitals and we, uh, and we welcome you all for this uh, three-part uh, series. Uh, so my topic is pathophysiology of traumatic brain injury. So before going into the pathophysiology, just a bit of uh, boring relevant uh, physiology. Uh, so talking of cerebral blood flow, uh, brain, uh, which is uh, quite a hungry uh, organ, uh, for an organ which is roughly about 2% of the body weight, which is usually around 1,400 to 1,600 grams in an adult uh, human being, uh, the cardiac output it, it takes uh, per minute is close to 20% of the entire uh, cardiac output. Uh, so the various factors which are influencing it, uh, the, they are umpteen uh, number to be uh, in, all, uh, in all fairness. But the few relevant ones which we'd like to discuss for the purpose of the for today's lecture would be uh, cerebral metabolic rate uh, and the relationship of carbon dioxide with cerebral blood flow and the oxygen with cerebral blood flow and uh, mean arterial pressure and CPP at large. So this is uh, an animal study. This is, uh, this is a graph which is showing a relationship between cerebral blood flow and uh, the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen, which is CMRO2. So what happened? This is a, this is this was done in a physiology physiology study. It's an animal study essentially, where uh, an animal was uh, incited with some sympathetic stimulation. So as expected, which would have there was increase of sudden surge of uh, CMRO2. So as we also notice that with CMRO2, the CDF also increased in tandem, and with uh, with duration as it reduced the CBF also comes. So this is a normal flow metabolism coupling. 
which is essential to understand which is normal this is again in normal human beings which is essential to understand uh, further uh and also as we know mean arterial pressure is also regulated with cerebral blood flow and uh in normal human adults uh mean arterial pressure of 60 to 160 is usually the place where the brain tries to protect itself with aberrant fluctuations of blood pressure so as the blood pressure increases as we see cerebral blood vessels they constrict themselves to ensure that the same amount of cerebral blood flow is going without any aberrations of course there are individual exceptions for example in a hypertensive patient this curve may shift to the right but in most of the abnormal patients this is the uh, bracket at which the cbf is operating so this is important to understand because this may be dysregulated in a traumatic brain injury patient and also another important point i'd like to mention is the concept of cerebral perfusion pressure so cerebral perfusion pressure uh, for those wondering it is mean arterial pressure minus the resistive forces which are acted upon in the brain which is the icp so in normal circumstances as we as we know that the regulation is done quite well when it's between 60 to 160 uh, millimeters of mercury of uh, mean arterial pressure however in a patient when for most of the anesthesiologists or most of the critical care people uh, most of the anesthesiologists on call when you get a traumatic brain injury case more or less we will be getting a patient in first few hours so where we are not sure of the icp so this is an important curve and this is an important principle to uh, make note of is essentially because we don't know what the icp is so our mep targets what we conventionally use say in a, a normal patients might have to change so this is again uh, talking of the same thing so usually 50 ml is the limit however uh, beyond the range it's usually pressure passive then the relationship with carbon dioxide and oxygen just couple of minutes on this so carbon dioxide as we see from the graph uh, this is the cerebral blood flow and the pco2 and the y and x axis where we can see that from the from uh, 20 mm mercury of pco2 to roughly about 70 to 80 mm of uh, P, pco2 the cerebral blood flow is all, almost exponentially or a uh, parallel uh, what is it uh, proportionally increasing with increase of pco2 so in a normal adults in normal uh, this could have a, a minimal bearing but in a patient with uh, traumatic brain injury even a small increase of pco2 could have uh, catastrophic uh, uh, results so to speak so this is an important thing to remember however po2 on the other hand has lesser bearing effect unless in a severe hypoxemia where its po2 goes less than 40 then cell blood flow has a bearing uh, otherwise pco2 is sort of a more major deterrent in uh, targeting or channeling the cerebral blood flow so this is again just uh, roughing up in the same uh, slide and now coming to the most important monroe kelly's doctrine which for, for those for any residents listening if there is one thing you want to take away from today's class i would want this to be it so what is monroe kelly's doctrine what they have essentially said is your brain is a brief case so pack light so essentially what they mean is a a brain which is a closed rigid cavity has three components so whenever there is a fourth unwanted guest so the three components are the brain parenchyma the csf and the blood we're not going into arterial blood venous blood but just to round it off there are three components present in a closed vault so when an unwanted guest like a bleed which happens a severe traumatic brain injury happens initially the regulatory mechanisms of csf and the blood kicking first the csf tries to displace itself as much as possible then the blood veins and the arteries they start to do their maximum limits then eventually what is happening is the brain which is uh, which is uh, getting squished in the process so this is the only thing i would say is the most most important uh, uh, in the pathophysiology of traumatic brain injury this is another important one as well uh, this is the pressure volume curve which is the relationship of intracranial volume and the intracranial pressure so going back to monroe kelly's doctrine what they've said so when all three of them are coexisting which is the brain the csf and the blood even with with an increase of intracranial volume of this extent the icp has hardly changed a small in include for example an sol which is growing over months uh, a space occupying lesion probably a cancer or a tumor which usually 
grows over months. So the change of volume may not be that much, at least in the initial phases where the lesion is smaller and manageable. But in a case of uh, traumatic brain injury, as we know that all the changes which happen, happen in a, minute, in a matter of minutes to hours, and sudden expanding hematoma, a sudden expanding contusion, could even a smallest increase of volume could cause a surge of ICP uh, in a rather uh, catastrophic fashion. So this is where, this is the most uh, dreadful position to be in, and this is where we'd like to be at. So uh, traumatic brain injury has been classified in various different ways for the purpose of this discussion, uh, for the purpose of um, uh, in today's uh, discussion. These are the most common conditions in which we encounter uh, when, a, when a case of traumatic brain injury gets wheeled in, say, for a decompressive craniotomy, or even in the ICU for that matter. So just to, just to roughly uh, talk of the anatomy, anatomical aspects a bit to make it a little more clear, so brain has three coverings. There is pia, arachnoid, and dura. So it is DAP from the outside. So as we say, this is the extradural space, which is the dura, which is a space between the dura and the skull. Now, the inner and the skull. Now, subdura is between dura and arachnoid. And these are the infraparenchymal spaces and infraparenchymal. This, under, this, this kind of... This was important for me to put the slide to kind of uh, break it down to, so that there won't be any confusion. So the first lesion is the EDH. As said, this is right above the dura and between the skull table. And uh, going back to our uh, undergraduate days where the biconvex appearing hyperdense or the white appearing biconvex structure is the extradural hemorrhage, which is an absolute emergency. And why is it biconvex? Because dura is attached into the inner, uh, to the uh, inner table of the skull at various suture lines. So, so the blood, the blood doesn't go anywhere else. So it just keeps expanding and pushing the brain further. So that's why this, though it has good prognosis when done on time, getting the patient on table and facilitating the decompression or the evacuation of the, uh, of the bleed um, is the paramount importance. The SDH, on the other hand, is inside the dura, but outside the brain parenchyma per se. So because it is not restricted by any suture lines, it takes a form of a crescent. And usually it's white when it's acute and darker in, it's a, it's a chronic SDH. This picture here is essentially an acute on chronic. So why this happens, especially in cases when there is acceleration, deceleration injuries in a road traffic accident, for example, the patient, uh, uh, the patient, when he was not patient, hit the divider, say, at 100 miles per hour or 100 kilometers per hour, and his entire skull has moved at a rate of knots. And once the skull hits something and stops, the brain inside continues to have that inertia. Now, because of that, there are multiple bridging veins which are present uh, between the dura and the brain, uh, and the brain parenchyma, which kind of splits up and forms this uh, bleed. In chronic SDH, also it happens, but however, this happens in the old age people in whom the brain is atrophied. So there the uh, mode of injury is often a trivial fall. So that's why that develops over time because it gives a space so there's no mass effect in chronic SDH. Uh, I hope I'm not uh, hurrying with this uh, slide. It's essential to understand that anything which is white is actually bleeding. So these are uh, hemorrhagic contusions, which are actually the inter uh, lobar bleeds, uh, so to speak. And most often than not, they're associated like here, we can see, uh, more often than not, they're associated with small SDHs, uh, which is uh, essentially is a continuation of the contusion. And there are also some SAH as well. So uh, traumatic uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage and traumatic intraventricular hemorrhages are often classified as a mild uh, traumatic brain injury, if they are, uh, if they are uh, uh, coming as an isolated uh, spectrum, so to speak. Uh, but however, usually SAHs are associated with other SDHs or contusions. So this, as we see, there's a mild SAH and there's IVH. So most of the times, uh, uh, plain SAH, IVH is often not the cause of concern. Diffuse axonal injury, another bad, bad traumatic brain injury. It's a diffuse kind of injury in which the patient appears comatose is comatose, comes to you and GCS of eight or nine uh, appears as though uh, 
all have hell broke loose but she just can doesn't actually find uh, uh, a pathological lesion let's say a bleed or something because in this what has happened is all the uh, because again of the same acceleration dislocation injury and a combination of rotational and torsional injuries there is breakage of axonal uh, uh, architecture most of the white matter is the one which gets affected so most of the times on day 1 when they are presenting in the uh, in the presenting the icu most most often to the icu we may not find any pathology in the ct scan uh, but in mri or diffuse tensor imaging which is good for tracks we may be able to uh, find but these are again um, because of the multiple axonal dis uh, disruptions more often than not the uh impairment the cognitive impairment and the neurological deterioration is quite uh, uh, evident now coming to the pathophysiology as we know there are uh, there are uh, pathophysiology can be actually uh, divided into a primary injury and a secondary injury now again there are multiple different ways pathophysiology has been uh, delineated and discussed and studied but for uh, to for the for the purpose of the study we would like to discuss it in two ways as primary injury and secondary injury so primary injury is that which happens at the time of injury for example somebody met with an rta somebody fell off a uh, third floor of the building or the fourth floor of the building so there is direct tissue damage which is happening so that is the primary injury which occurs at the time of the injury so depends on the gravity of the direct tissue of uh, tissue damage there could also obviously have an impaired regulation of blood flow impaired metabolism which we previously discussed now both these two, uh, factors may eventually as a uh, consequence lead to secondary injury now this could take few seconds to minutes and sometimes perhaps days so as we see here primary injury is happening at the spot say for example an sdh of frontal lobe but a secondary injury it could be at a, at a at a wide spectra of region across the brain because lot of other factors which some of some modifiable and some non modifiable which are uh, at play in uh, uh, causing the secondary injury to grow so as clinicians as uh, anesthesiologists and critical care uh, physicians uh, this is one one of the most important aspect to uh, remember that uh, we can only influence or rather most of our in involvement most of our modification or prevention um of traumatic brain injury actually happens at preventioning of the secondary injury so as we said the cerebral blood flow can be dysregulated there could be hypoxia uh, uh, ischemia impaired microcirculation and energy failure energy failure again because of atps all the atps are pump related for which you need glucose for which you need blood so it, it is all uh, related so that's how the primary injury ends up with secondary injury if these things are not influenced or modified on time then a quick word on cerebral blood flow and traumatic brain injury so as we discuss what happens to normal cerebral blood flow when there is sudden surge of blood pressure or sudden drop drop of blood pressure it regulates but in traumatic brain injury it may not be the case as we notice here when there is in this is in cases with preserved auto regulation or in normal people in general when there is sudden spike of map which is the case in most of the times in the initial aspects of the traumatic brain injury after the primary injury there is a sudden surge of catecholamine the sudden surge of sympathetic uh, system in the body which would raise uh, bp uh, in many individuals so here uh, the usually the body tries to conserve the cerebral blood flow but, uh, 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 but in traumatic brain injury this may not be the case in a uh, few individuals where despite the increase of blood flow the icp keep, keeps on raising because the brain is not able to regulate so the cerebral blood flow shoots up the icp shoots up and when the icp shoots up again going back to a formula of uh, cerebral perfusion pressure is mean arterial pressure minus icp so what happens when the icp shoots up? cerebral perfusion pressure falls further so this is the interaction between the uh, mean arterial pressure and what happens if the regulation is intact and brain regulation is not intact so again as uh, as said after traumatic brain injury there are phases of hypo hyperperfusion but one might say that it it may not be that bad to have more blood uh, but again in patients again again that will bring me to the concept of blood brain barrier compared to the uh, in comparison to our uh, peripheral vasculature 
our brain has a tendency to protect itself by creating a blood brain barrier which has gap junctions which is which is a very complex structure I'm not going to too much of detail but essentially what blood brain barrier does it it tries to prevent the unwanted entry of solutes inside the brain so what happens in a case of a traumatic brain injury that there could be a damage of a physical damage of blood brain barrier again this sudden surge of cerebral blood flow what we talking of in the initial moments after the primary impact maybe normal maybe well tolerated by normal individuals but in a patient with a partly breached blood brain barrier or a dysfunctional blood brain barrier or in who the vascular permeability has surged up all of a sudden it could also raise a increase in cerebral pressure then what happens to carbon dioxide reactivity we previously discussed that it regulates between 20 to 80 but uh, as a uh, as a fact of matter that carbon dioxide reactivity's presence or absence many a times decides the prognosis in most of the traumatic brain injury cases cerebral blood flow regulation may be hampered but in most of the patients we do see that carbon dioxide reactivity does remain intact and in some instances it is even found to have been uh, slightly uh, more uh, so to speak and that again brought in the role uh, uh, as a measure of therapy in acute icp crisis and then just summing it up quickly so primary injury is that which happens at the time of injury so there are there is vascular perturbation blood brain barrier rupture there is bleed there is axillary injury if is doi with severe amount of a burst of neuroinflammation now when this happens and that joined by certain reversible secondary injury factors and some other pathological process which we'll be dealing shortly it patient lands up with neurological deficit sometimes for life and not only neurological deficit uh, not only means that the patient is suffering but the entire family gets on uh, literally or practically uh, it affects the vocation sometimes a single bread owner earner of the family might uh, succumb and uh may become cognitively impaired for the rest of his life and not able to work so definitely prevention of second injury has huge role and uh in that regard then coming to the secondary brain injury as said so this is a constellation of biochemical cellular and physiological events that occur in tandem uh sometimes one after the other and most of the times in tandem though in the conventional sense it is not mechanically induced but again definitely we cannot completely say it is not mechanically induced but it is definitely mechanically in, uh, influenced so to speak so the multiple factors which govern the secondary brain injuries few in our hands and few not in but those in our hand could be systemic causes like hypoxia hypo hypotension anemia uh, carbon dioxide levels hypothermia i'm not including hypothermia for a reason but hypoglycemia dyslipidemia acid base disorders loss of auto regulation and these are the wide arrays of conditions which one as as a both as an anesthesiologist or a critical care consultant should keep in mind to ensure that these are not taken care of because traumatic brain injury is a difficult horse to tame and when we can avoid the systemic causes of secondary brain injury with a central contributors more often than not we may or may not have in our hand but what we can definitely do is is ensure that we pick that sugar uh, that sugar drop on time or the dyslipidemia on time or the acid base disorder on time or what preventing a simple uh, anemia for that matter could be could go a long way in management of traumatic brain injury and the other central contributors like edema intracranial hypotension and seizure activity especially even the non convulsive state uh, non convulsive non convulsive um, uh, seizure activity that is uh, expected in these patients of course i'm not going too much into detail and infection prevention vasospasm spasm and cortical spreading depolarization which i'll come uh, in shortly so these are the various pathophysiological mechanisms which are acting once the primary injury is hit it leads to an array of pathophysiological uh, uh, consequences which are growing in tandem one after the other in causing the secondary injury so first is the edema there are multiple types of edema not going into too much of detail again but on a basic on a basic fundamental level uh there is a vasogenic edema and then there is a cytotoxic edema these two are very important to understand uh because the edema is the biggest uh, challenge what one faces in the first 
24 to 48 hours. So the patient comes to us in the OT as well. So this is again, Dr. Gaurav will be dwelling more on how you measure. Uh, so I'm not going to detail. So pathophysiologically, what is happening is there is a blood-brain barrier disruption. So as said, there is vasogenic edema. There is, uh, there is nothing holding back the unwanted surging of cerebral blood flow. And there is cytotoxic edema. Now cytotoxic edema, on the other hand, may or may not have blood-brain barrier. More often than not, the blood-brain barrier is intact. But the cytotoxic edema is essentially that which happens because of ischemia. It could be because of hypoperfusion, hypoanemia, or hypoxia. These are the causes of edema. So uh, as we see here, this is a normal-looking brain. And with edema, uh, as we see, the uh, uh, subretinoid spaces have been completely obliterated. The normal guidal sulci pattern have gone uh, just as a, by the way, mat. Then ICP rays, we've already discussed this. ICP, again, is a both a cause and a consequence. So ICP, uh, as we know, again, going back to the good old formula of cerebral perfusion pressure of MAP minus ICP. Now, ICP determines how much of brain, how much of blood the brain gets. Because the more the ICP, less the CPP. So what happens? There is hematoma or the diffuse injury. ICP is elevated. There is ischemia. And when the secondary insults happen, now this further cause ICP increase. So ICP is both a cause and the consequence. So, so again, coming back to the thing to brush up. So initially, as we said in the original diagram, where the initial volumes were increasing, but the ICP remained normal because there was nothing else to deal with. But in traumatic brain injury patients, the curve shifts up. So even the smallest of increase in volume, even the smallest of increase of anything, be it PCO2, the patient's head is too low, in the next, if the IJV is compressed, any of the smallest of things, as simple as patient is having fever, there could be a sudden surge of uh, ICP. Then other uh, pathophysiological processes, like in severe traumatic brain injury, there is sudden surge of release of excitatory amino acid, uh, amino, uh, acid uh, neurotransmitters like glutamate, which cause a sudden surge of calcium influx, calcium overload, and instill a constellation of catabolic processes, which would both cause necrosis and apoptosis by the, by the activation of caspases and endonucleosis, and there's lipopure peroxidation as well. So not going in again, too much of dissection. I'm trying to just brush it, what exactly happens. The patient hits up and then all the uh, all health groups down in the brain, uh, including your excitatory amino acids. And of course, mixed up with the oxidative stress. So usually the free radicals are causing the damage and body has a, an inherent mechanism of endogenous antioxidant system, which are trying to kill out or clear out the reactive oxygen species of the free radicals. So what happens here in traumatic brain injury, same thing happens. There is Sudden surge of free radicals, sudden surge of reactive oxygen species with uh, uh, sudden exhaustion of antioxidant systems, which adds to the uh, pain. The neuro uh, inflammation has been covered, uh, just, uh, 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 just not trying to beat around the bush too much. So there would be, again, because of the damaged blood brain barrier, neutrophils and monocytes surgeon. And then there are upregulated macrophages upregulated T-cells, and regulated T-cells are suddenly declined. So these are all uh, inflammatory milieu. Those for traumatic brain injury in the post, um, uh, right after the traumatic brain injury, for the first two through two, three days is extremely crucial, where it's almost like a pro-inflammatory milieu, where all of it trying to attack and trying to rebuild and trying to protect itself is causing more damage. Then mitochondrial dysfunction, as we know, mitochondria is a cell uh, is a, a powerhouse of a cell and which is essential for ATP production for most of the aerob aerobic uh, metabolisms. So what happens if in, in, in one aerobic cycle, if there's 36 ATPs, so there's mitochondrial dysfunction all over right after traumatic brain injury, it goes into a phase of anaerobic, um, uh, uh, anaerobic metabolism, which gives two ATPs. So there is lactate building, there is severe amount of energy loss, at the same time with the building calcium load and with the losing of, uh, uh, what is it uh, now? Uh, with the losing of the neuroprotection, uh, it, it adds on. So it's all a mutually coexisting process that one thing leads to another 
and eventually the secondary brain uh, tissue ends. As I said, there is excess release of glutamate, external toxicity, energy crisis, ATP pump failure, mitochondrial dysfunction. All of this eventually lands up with apoptosis and necrosis. So there's again few uh, uh, cases in which the secondary brain injury can go on uh, because of say a vasospasm. In few patients, at least one third of the traumatic brain injury patients, they could have an associated traumatic SAH. Uh, in these patients, vasospasm is known uh, to occur uh, many a time. It could be an angiographic evidence. It could not be missed. Uh, many a times you see traumatic SAH and the vessel is not to be found or the vessel is not often found. So this is an important uh, cause. This is another important cause of uh, secondary brain injury in traumatic, in, uh, traumatic, in severe traumatic brain injury patients, especially in uh, severe brain injury with uh, very poor improvement. In those cases, we actually see it very often. Uh, and the onset also varies. In a conventional uh, androsomal subarachnoid hemorrhage, the vasospasm is slightly later to 40 to 14 days. In this, it happens much early, as early as day one to day two, and sometimes in few hours uh, where uh, we end up uh, seeing vasospasm. And the vasospasm in trauma, the hypoperfusion which causes has a sure shot or a much profound effect on, neuro on neurological outcomes as opposed to a stage where we see that vasospasm not always reflects, especially unless it's an angiographic vasospasm, not always causes uh, uh, delayed cerebral ischemia or uh, neurological deficit. So some of the postulated uh, mechanisms still poorly understood, uh, but few possible uh, theories could be that the sudden vasoconstriction that happens because of uh, heightened uh, uh, inflammation because of lack of or uh, depleting sources of CGMP, which causes reduct, uh, reduced nitric oxide, which we know is a potent to vasodilator, and accentuation of prostaglandin vaso, uh, induced vasoconstriction are some of the postulated uh, mechanisms for uh, vasospasm in post traumatic uh, brain injury scenario. <clears throat> Uh, then the concept of cortical spread and depolarization, uh, just last, last couple of slides uh, as we go. This is a newer emerging concept uh, I would, would just I wanted to involve. Of course, it is, uh, it is a, uh, essentially a wave of neuronal activity, uh, a wave of neuronal depolarization which goes across the gray matter. So what happens is in most of the conditions so where there is sudden brain involvement, where the sudden brain, the sudden brain... Uh, with the sudden brain, uh, with the sudden brain parenchymal involvement, uh, could be because of traumatic brain injury or because of a sudden uh, in unusual subarachnoid hemorrhage, or patients with. Uh, it's also seen with status epilepticus or refractory status epilepticus. There is sudden wave of depolarization which is going across, which causes uh, an array of things, which causes the intraneural changes uh, to go toxic, and causes irreversible damage. This is an important concept to know, especially for prognosticating patients. Um, uh, in in uh, recent literature, uh, traumatic brain injury patients who have shown evidence of cortical spreading depolarization, uh, which is essentially a continuous brain activity which is happening. As we know, that there is problem with CBF and CMRO2 in traumatic brain injury. So in that scenario, if there is a persistent cerebral activity, so that, that is definitely counterproductive, especially in a traumatic brain injury patient. Uh, yeah. So all that we do is essentially to prevent the herniation because these are the various herniations. Uh, it's, a, it's, an entirely, uh, it's an entirely huge topic in itself, but just for the, for, uh, for the, sake, of this, uh, for the sake of this lecture, uh, we know that there's a mass effect and this is what happens. As Monroe, Coley, uh, Monroe Kelly has uh, hypothesized, uh, doctrine that when there is a mass, there is a pressure on the brain parenchyma and it's and the CSF. As we see, the CSF spaces are pushed apart, and it could cause herniation from various openings in the brain. Could be transcalvarial, can calvarial, it could subfalcine where the gyrus uh, uh, goes out, and there could be downward tonsillar uh, herniation as well. So thank you. Uh, I hope that was not boring, and I hope. I was legible enough, uh, sorry, uh, audible enough uh, to make the head or tail of what I was trying to say. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
Uh, and thank you, Rahul. Uh, can you unshare your slides? Yeah. So after Rahul uh, has talked about the basic pathophysiology of traumatic brain injury, uh, Gaurav, can you please share your slides? Uh, we uh, move on to the next part of the uh, webinar, that is clinical management of patients after traumatic brain injury. Uh, Dr. Gaurav Kakkar will be talking about it. And Dr. Gaurav Kakkar is uh, uh, the lead consultant in neuroanesthesiology uh, at Abritha Hospitals, and that is our Abritha School of Medicine. And uh, he is, uh, be, uh, has been trained in neuroanesthesiology in the United Kingdom. And he was working as a consultant in the United Kingdom before joining us. And uh, Dr. Gaurav uh, is very interested in the uh, teaching programs. He is an international trainer in uh, ENLS. He is the founder and medical director of Brain STEMI, uh, which is a neurostimulation program. Then he is also an honorary fellow of the Society of New uh, Neurocritical Care. And uh, he had received a presidential citation in 2022 in the SNAC. Uh, over to Dr. Gaurav, please. Gaurav, can you make it slide share about it now? Uh, sorry, in the make it the yeah. Other book. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the kind words, uh, and thank you to IS, ICA for this uh, opportunity to just, to do a session on traumatic brain injury. Uh, thank you, Rahul, for bringing out the salient points in the traumatic brain injury physiology. I bring greetings from uh, Amrita Hospital, Faridabad, and the aim of the lecture is to go through the treatment of the TBI patient. Uh, using the current evidence that we have, the global care of a TBI patient that comes to you. Now, I'm going to touch on the TBI treatment in three salient parts or <clears throat> three divided into three parts, the treatment, uh, the monitoring, and the thresholds that we're going to work on. The treatments are based on the uh, TBI uh, management, the Brain Trauma Foundation Management Guidelines. And uh, just to recapitulate for the uh, younger audience, uh, the, what I'll be quoting is the studies and the levels of evidence. They are class one, two, three individual studies in terms of the good quality class one randomized trials. Class two would be moderate quality RCTs and class three is low quality RCTs. And the level of recommendations are level one, two, A, two, B, three. Level one being based on good quality of evidence coming from the best RCTs. Two A comes from moderate qualities of evidence and the remaining coming from low quality individual or expert evidence. So the treatment paradigm in terms of uh, the uh, <clears throat> treatment section, I'll go through these headings. They seem a lot, but I'll try and make them as simplified as possible. The, let's see if I can get my slides to work. Why they stop working? Okay, so the treatment is nothing, and to keep it simple, it's an A, B, C, D, E, F, G approach. The A has to be done with the cervical spine control because lots of your TBI patients are going to have cervical spine injuries. If you want a percentage, anywhere between 15 to 20%. So it's very important that the cervical spine is under control whenever you have a TBI patient in the emergency. Um, if not... Uh, any evidence there before the trauma, if it comes to you without any history, assume before it's clear that the, the cervical spine is not clear. Uh, the B stands for breathing. The C stands for circulation. The D is for neurology. The E is all the extras that you need to do. The F is temperature of Fahrenheit. And G is don't forget the glucose. So it is very simple if you keep a single pattern approach for your entire team to treat an ABCD EFG approach for a TBI patient. Now, this approach needs to be followed right from when you get to the patient initially. It does not have to be when the patient comes to you in the ICU. If you are in the AE, this has to be when you reach the AE. Or if it's beforehand, which is the first scenario of pre hospital care, which we're trying to develop in our country, then the same thing applies beforehand as well. The chain of survival depends upon how we manage this head injury right from at the site during the transport. Transport means within the hospital as well. The care does not depend upon where the patient is. 
So as I say all the time, the neurocritical care is not just dependent of a neuro care inside the critical care. It happens when you get your hands on to a head injury patient, wherever that patient might be. So during the transport in the hospital, then the ICU. Right. So in terms of evidence for the ABCD EFG stabilizing approach, you have a decompressive craniectomy for most of the TBI patients. That happens in our country. We are one side of the curve where we don't monitor the ICP as much. Depending upon the scan and a low GCS, a patient is intubated and goes to what we call a decompressive craniectomy to relieve the pressure. What is a decompressive craniectomy? That is a part of the bone is taken off so that the inside, the brain can be relaxed, the clot uh, or whatever the collection is can be taken care of. That's a decompressive craniectomy. You'll see these orange boxes coming up in the presentation. This is the levels of evidence that the individual treatment has. So that's a level 2A evidence for the decompressive craniectomy in the BTF guidelines. Now, a bifrontal one, that means opening both sides, is not recommended. Um, a large one is recommended. That means what is large? At least a 15 centimeter diameter or a 12 by 15 centimeter. So a smaller one done doesn't do any good to the patient. If you want a good outcome, the decompressive that decompression that's done has to be a, a bigger one. There were two distinct trials. There were many trials on the decompressive ones, but these are namely the DECRA and the rescue ICP trials that came up. And we can discuss those two uh, trials independently. But there were a lot of shortcomings in those trials. So what they did was uh, they improved the survival of the patient, but not the outcome. So the results of the rescue ICP trial said that that can be helpful as a last tier intervention to improve the survival. But the outcome of these patients might not be the best because most of these patients would be dependent on somebody after 12 months. So there are tier therapies to manage the increased pressure in the brain. So the most important that needs to be done is get that patient elevated. So once that patient that you see comes to you, uh, whether it is in the emergency medicine department that you see or in the ICU or in the OT for that matter, that patient's airway has to be controlled. The patient has to be sedated, paralyzed. And what you can do as an anesthesiologist or a critical care physician is to get that table head up, get that trolley head up. Now, what that does is instantly brings that ICP or the intracranial pressure down. And it is very effective. And you can be that surgeon because you will bring that pressure down by at least five to eight millimeters of mercury with what the studies have shown. And that's a lot of pressure coming down. Now, we go down these steer therapies uh, as to what, uh, how the ICPs, if they don't respond to treatment. So sedating, ventilating, maintaining oxygenation, maintaining good pressure, getting the patient head up. That's what is the first and most important thing. CPP is the cerebral perfusion pressure, as Rahul said. If you can aim at 60, that means a lot of hard work will be required. You can't measure or you can't assume CPP, mostly in Indian scenarios because you're not measuring ICP. So you got to assume that the ICP is at least 25 to 30. That means you got to get at least a mean arterial pressure of around 85 to 90. That will be difficult in polytrauma scenarios. That will be difficult in acute scenarios because you got to fill that patient up, the patient who's sedated and paralyzed and get the blood pressure up by filling up and putting some inotropes or vasopressors. Do not compromise the sedation just to generate blood pressure because the Tense brain requires sedation to bring the CMRO2 down. Do paralyze these patients because every bout of cough on a tube or a GCS3 patients will kill more neurons than anything. Once you've done all that, then you can go to the next level, which is drainage of CSF or give mannitol or 3% saline. Doesn't matter what you give, you can give either mannitol or saline. If you have a choice, hypertonic or 3% saline is preferred. You can give a bolus of about 200 ml. If you don't have your hands on saline, give mannitol. Give a proper dose. Do not give fruzomide to get the ICP down. If you get, give a proper dose of mannitol, that is at least half a gram per kilogram and repeat it, a proper mannitol dose will cause diuresis on its own. 
Then comes the second phase of decompressive craniectomies. And then the third phase or the third tier of heavy sedations, query, query, hypothermia and hyperventilations. So decompressive craniectomies, we said it's there as a tier therapy, but the evidence says that we produce more survivals, but there might not be the best outcomes. Temperature, is it good to reduce the temperature so that the brain can be saved if the pressure in the brain is high after a TBI patient? Well, the early after injury prior to ICP elevation, prophylactic, no evidence, therapeutic for refractory elevation, no evidence. So there's a level 2B that early short term is not recommended and it causes more harm to the patients. Now, there were enough trials to say this as well. There was these polar trials and the Eurotherm trials, and none of them actually gave us any benefit in terms of survival for the patients with raised ICP. So actually, if you put these patients where they actually me measured the ICP of these patients and gave them hypothermia, the mortality was high and the outcome was worse. So do not actively increase somebody's temperature if it is at least 35, 30.5, let them slowly warm up. That's fine. Uh, a high temperature is bad for the brain. So if the temperature is more than 37 or 37.5, if it is 38, 39, do active measures to get it down because hyperthermia is very bad for the brain. But don't go actively cooling a patient of traumatic brain injury. Hyperosmolar therapy, it is very important. Um, after you've done the initial ABC, and you assume that the pressure is high after your scans, then, as I said, give mannitol or hypertension, hypertonic saline. Now, initially, it, there was a good recommendation for it. Um, at the moment, there is a neutral recommendation. If you were to choose between mannitol versus hypertonic saline, uh, I can't tell you in terms of evidence you choose one over the other, but if you ask me a personal preference, it is hypertonic saline. I would say give whatever you get your hands on, don't waste time, but give a proper dose uh, of mannitol or hypertonic saline. If you do give something, make sure that the bladder is catheterized. A very practical point. I've seen patients, TBI patients, sedated, ventilated, getting mannitol, repeated dose of mannitol and not catheterized and a huge tense bladder. There can be nothing more worse than that for a brain, brain that's asking for resuscitation. Uh, ventilatory therapies, uh, that airway of a TBI patient, obviously because it is a low GCS, needs to be protected. Uh, it needs to be protected from aspiration. It also needs to be protected so that enough oxygen can be delivered to the injured brain. So you need a good airway protection. Ventilation, a normal oxygen tension is required. Um, very recently, there was some work on hyperoxia in the brain and there was uh, an article uh, claiming hyperoxemia in the brain might be bad, but uh, that jury is not out yet. Uh, we need more brain tissue oxygenation studies properly done to claim that, whether localized hyperoxemia is better or not. But the message should be clear that an injured brain in the acute scenario should get enough oxygen. So if there are problems with ventilation, that needs to be sorted out. Simple things first. So get the tube in, get the tube sorted in terms of positioning. Make sure it is not too far in. Make sure the patient is well paralyzed, well sedated, so that ventilation can happen properly, so that oxygen can go to the brain. Uh, basic things usually are done, but you'll be surprised how often they are not done as well. Coming to CO2, the CO2 has to be in the normal range. In the long term or in the uh, acute, after the initial acute period, the carbon dioxide, if kept too low, is bad for the brain because a low CO2 will cause low cerebral blood flow and cerebral ischemia. That's not good. A high PO CO2, on the other hand, is going to cause vasodilatation and hyperemia, which again is going to be bad. There is only a small caveat here, is the very acute brain, if you get your hands on it early, you are allowed hyperventilation to some extent to get the CO2 down a little bit, and that gives you the buffer to buy time to get the patient to open the skull. 
So a little bit of hyper, hyper, carb, hyper ventilation to get the CO2 down is allowed and it does get the pupils down and saves the patients. But <clears throat> you've got to be sure that it doesn't stay that for long. So as a temporary measure, it is recommended. And after the first 24 hours, you want to make sure that the CO2 at least is normal. So prolonged hyperventilation with a partial pressure uh, of 25 meters less is not recommended. And that's a level 2B evidence for that. What about keeping these patients asleep, analgesia and sedatives? So it's important that these patients get sedated properly. Uh, the most common used regimes are an, a mixture of sedatives in terms of propofol or uh, analgesic in terms of fentanyl. Barbiturates uh, can be used if you struggle with ICP as a tier three thing, but you got to be careful in terms of managing the blood pressure because all of these are going to depress the cardiac output, depress the blood pressure. So you got to make sure that your patients have enough filling. Uh, if it's a polytrauma, if you've lost blood, even if it is an isolated head injury, it can lose a lot of blood from the scalp. So if there is blood loss, give blood and you need to put inotropes or vasopressors for the effect of these sedatives. Don't bring the sedation down just to keep your blood pressure up. So there is a 2B evidence uh, for barbiturates not to be used if you're using it for burst suppression. Uh, it can be used as a tier 3 measure for control of the ICP if required. Uh, you've got to be very careful with the high doses because you'll have end up with problems of high doses of barbiturates in terms of um, uh, cardiac output depression and, and so on. So propofol actually doesn't figure out in the recommendation, but as the most commonly used drug. And because it's the most commonly used drug and known most for the anesthetist, it's safe to do in normal doses. How about steroids? Can these patients be given steroids? Uh, the logic behind it was that it reduces the CSF production, it restores vascular permeability, reduces the free radical production. So initially some TBI patients started get giving steroids. The evidence was for it was tested in these trials, the crash trials and the subsequent trials. Uh, these were big trials, multi-center trials, and the evidence for that was not there. So this, the steroids were causing harm. I put this slide as a crash, another crash. This crash was important for the TBI patient. And I say this crash is important because a drug that can be given here for a TBI patient uh, is a very cheap drug. It is available everywhere. It's tranaxamic acid. It's, not, it's got nothing to do with steroids, but I put the crash here so that I don't miss out. And I uh, want to, to make sure that the message is conveyed that a tranaxamic acid given in a good dose, given within a few hours of injury, if coming to the hospital, actually helps reducing the mortality due to bleeding. And the evidence is there. So a gram, gram and a half of, of tranaxamic acid given to a patient within four hours if they come to you can help the patient out. And that evidence was replicated in all these trials. So tranaxamic acid is a very cheap, very readily available drug, which you must consider. Coming back to the steroids, not recommended to improve ICP. And if they get given for any reason, they actually will cause harm to the patient. And that's a level when one recommendation not to be used. What about nutrition for these patients? Do these patients require nutrition? TBI is a catabolic state. A lot of energy is consumed. And these patients do require nutrition. After the initial phase of the first 24, 48 hours, these patients need to be on some sort of a feed. By maximum day five, if a TBI patient is not on feed, then the outcomes start to go down. So... A 2A evidence suggests that the basal caloric requirement of the patient must be met by fifth day, at most the seventh day post-injury, to decrease the mortality. That's a very good level of evidence, and we must, must achieve this. Uh, even if there are problems of 
uh, aspiration or have problems of bigger aspirants coming from the ng feed there are ways to counteract that you can give tropic feeds that is small amounts of continuous feeds so a fed gut protects the brain even if it is at low volume you must do it uh, how about infection prophylaxis do the tbi patients routinely meet infections if it is a polytrauma then yes you would be on it anyway but if it's an isolated tbi it depends upon what uh, what particular invasive things are we doing so mechanical ventilation is a risk invasive monitoring if you're doing icp or if you put an evd that's a risk up to 25% of the patients uh, who either have an evd or an icp bolt are at risk of infection and do get infection so they need to be on antibiotics they do grow multi resistant bugs the the chances of ventilator associated pneumonia is as high as 40% uh, quoted by some studies so you need to have antibiotics to cover that so you must look at your individual antimicrograms and the microbiograms of the hospital to to tailor the drugs uh can we reduce the use of vap early tracheo- tracheostomy uh it reduces the number of mechanical ventilated days but it doesn't do much to reduce the mortality or the rate of nosocomial uh, pneumonias and the other oral washes in terms of providon care iodine actually have did not show any evidence to reduce the vap so they are not recommended the evds or the antimicrobial catheters which are coated with antimicrobials may be considered to prevent uh, evd infections and that's a level 3 evidence so not a great evidence now this is a big big issue in every neuro icu that is unrecognized deep vein thrombosis or missed deep vein thrombosis so even outside the icus uh, neurological patients with neurological illnesses who are immobile for even for you know a week or so if they are high risk they can develop deep vein clots so you have to have a high incidence high screening program in the hospitals to do that uh, if they are not without a treatment that is no non pharmacological treatment as well then the incidence can be as high as 54% but even with sequential the scd boots if you have them and no pharmacological treatment you can have 25% incidence in the dvts so it is uh, the risk factors are all there because of motor deficits immobilization hypercoagulability so you must have at least a non pharmacological way that is all these patients need to be on the scd boots uh, air mattresses to prevent pressure sores and all obviously there but pharmacological preventions for dvt uh, it should be there once your uh, surgical input is decided and the surgical team and along with them you decide when it is safe to do it so it is a level 3 evidence obviously you need to figure out what type of uh, brain injury it is and whether hematoma expansion is an issue but at least non pharmacological measures should be there from day 1 seizures these patients because of the tbi injury are at risk of seizures and these seizures can be early that's because of the primary injury within 7 days or they can be late after 7 days as well so if you were to strictly ask for the definition of post traumatic seizures they technically uh or the epilepsy if you were to label it as a post traumatic epilepsy epilepsy then it is after 7 days that the definition would term that as epilepsy so the risk factors are all there but the higher risk factors are penetrating injuries uh, big contusions young age group uh, less gcss presentations immediate seizures on an on presentation and chronic alcoholism risk factors for post traumatic ones uh, as continued uh, will be severe tbi acute big bleeds uh, and what you can do is uh, phenytoin the levipil which is the most commonly used drug so far doesn't figure out in any recommendations but uh, it does help in terms of individual studies so it's the same story as manitol versus hypertonic but it's good to give an anti epileptic one for all these high risk cases but within the 7 days of injury 
Beyond that, the evidence for anti-epileptics isn't there. So long-term um, use of anti-epileptics isn't there, but we do see our patients up to four weeks on that. That is fine because uh, everybody is worried about them, including our surgeons. So, But beyond four weeks, uh, if the patient doesn't have seizures and is input on that, make sure they're off the anti-epileptics or at least taper them. So this was the treatment part of the TBI patient with an ABCD approach, looking at the evidence of individual therapies. Now I want to look at the monitoring part of the talk as to what do we monitor. So we want to monitor the ICP so that you can get the CPP. Uh, now, does monitoring the ICU, ICP, that is intracranial pressure, help? The evidence for that is yes. It's a level two evidence, level two B evidence, because it does reduce in hospital and two week post injury mortality. And that has been there for many years. The reason we don't do monitoring of ICP in India, when I say don't do, I mean routinely for every patient of TBI where it is indicated as a routine, not just for thesis, not just for a presentation, not just for a, for a research project. We don't do because our training in terms of the surgical side is a decompressive training. Cost, I personally don't think is an issue. So it's a training issue. Once we get around that, maybe we we'll, one day we we'll start measuring the ICP. But I'll come to that later on, that the world has gone beyond the ICP and we miss the ICP bus, but we must not miss the next bus that I'll talk about. So ICP measurement is required uh, wherever possible. Uh, the CPP theory has come from the ICP. So that obviously uh, continuing with the mortality reduction, it does help. Now, these are the advanced measures of monitoring. Uh, so the transclavial Doppler has been there, uh, but hasn't shown us in terms of level one evidence. Same for microdialysis, but the brain tissue oxygenation on its own has uh, been the most promising one. That, that has helped us in, in terms of predicting where the oxygen requirement in the brain is going to go less. That again is done from the same ICP probe. You can take out, measure the ICP as well as the brain tissue oxygenation. And what it does is gives you a, some warning that the hypoxemia, local hypoxemia in the brain tissue is going to happen. And that might give you a chance to correct that. And studies have shown that the ICP rise after that is after a few hours. So that's the idea of brain tissue oxygenation. So what happened was in two years ago, all these chaps who had written the big guidelines about ICP many years ago got together. And these were this was the Seattle conference where they came out with their TBI guidelines. This is called the CIBIC guidelines. And they've clubbed the ICP and the brain tissue together. So we know that the compliance is a very difficult thing to understand in the brain. And we have softwares to measure the compliance. You know things like pressure reactivity. That just means that in every ICP raised patient, every TBI patient, when we raise the ICP, when we raise the CPP, sorry, not all of them do well. And the reason for that is that not every brain is compliant. That means every time you push the blood pressure up, only in a compliant brain, pushing the blood pressure up or pushing the CPP up will help in controlling the ICP or delivering um, the flow and the nutrients. So that is a compliant brain, but we do not know from outside which is a compliant brain and which is not. And that's where this ABCD four types clubbing with brain tissue oxygenation helps us. So for type A injury where the ICP is low and the brain tissue oxygenation is more than 20 millimeters of mercury, you can carry on doing what you are doing because that's good. In type B injuries, when the brain tissue oxygenation is good, but the ICP is more, you can do your simple measures, the tiered measures that we talked about, and that will help. The oxygenation is not a problem. But there can be a type C injury in which the ICP is normal, but the brain tissue oxygenation is not good. So here, putting the oxygenation up helps. And, and that prevents the ICP from going up after three hours or four hours. So that's where what this algorithm helps. So there are individual algorithms for these four types of patients. The type B patient is very sick, whose ICP is high, as well as his oxygenation is low. 
So this patient gets the tier three or the surgical part or whatever, but this is where the future is. And this is where the core neurocritical care units are working and by putting patients in these individual boxes. We miss the ICP bus, but I think if we get it on with now, we might get on to the, doing these two together if we can in India. So that was the monitoring part of it. The ICP can be measured with, uh, with the ICP intraparenchymal, the subdural bolts. Uh, we need the surgical consult and we need the surgical inclination to do that. If it doesn't happen, we should go the Canadian way and do it ourselves as intensivists. EVD, people say we do EVDs to measure ICPs. We do do it, but that's um, predominantly used to drain CSF and bring the ICP down. That is not a great way of measuring a continuous ICP in a patient. Right, so treatment part's done, and uh, a word about monitoring is done. I'll just talk about certain thresholds that are important in managing a TBI patient. And what is the magical number? What If you measure ICP, what is that? Uh, what is the magical CPP number? And what blood pressure threshold you should do that? So the evidence is that keep the blood pressure up. And that's a level three evidence um, for keeping a systolic of 100 for people 50 to 69 and 110 for younger than that. And the whole idea behind that is about the CPP. The ICP measure, the magic number is 22, is the recommended one where ICP more than that causes increased mortality. It was it used to be 25, they brought it down to 22. So if uh, it was at some studies of the initial trials that I showed, I had at 20 as well. So the middle number is 22 for now, but the range is important. And those of you who measured ICP would understand that. Those of you who haven't measured ICP, uh, it will be good for you to see ICP measurement and uh, uh, see how simple measures uh, done can actually reduce ICP very quickly. So a combination of ICP and CT values use management decisions is a level three evidence. Cerebral perfusion pressure is a favorable outcome is a 2B evidence. That means 60 if you achieve is a good number. So initially it used to be 70, 75, but they brought it down to 60 as well. 60, 60 is fine uh, because what happened was if, if you were really chasing the numbers, the study shows that if you were really chasing the number beyond 70 or 75, people were ending up on, on very high doses of inotropes and that was being counterproductive with other multi-organ failures because of vasopressors and inotropes with the ARDS gut ischemia as well. So... The 60 is an achievable number. Most of this evidence actually comes from pediatric neurosurgery where the CPP is as low as 50 has shown as good outcome as well. So but 60 for adult is the minimum that we need to have. And there's a good evidence to avoid aggressive attempts to chase a CPP of 70. That means if you have a good mean of 85, 90 and a decent systolic of 110, 120, that is fine. Keep that patient sedated, ventilated, head up, good pressure, good oxygen, and you've done your best. Um, jugular venous saturations be of less than 50% it can be avoided, but many units don't do that. Now, what about sugars? So the A, B, C, D, E, F, the G is sugar. Sugars are very important for the brain. And what is not good for the brain is hypoglycemia. So aggressive control of the sugars is not required. As long as they are decent, that means less than 180 more than 100 is fine. Don't need to aggressively go and chase the sugars. <coughs> Sorry. Um, hemorrhage control is very important. Uh, so if the patient presents with a polytrauma, then you need to get into the polytrauma mode, make sure the primary hemorrhages are controlled. If they're long bone fractures, that need to be uh, stabilized. If they are coagulopathies, that need to be controlled. Because if the if the brain hematoma is expanding, it's no good. So you need to need, give your bloods, blood products, do a tag if that's available, do give tranexamic acid. So if I were to summarize a TBI patient, I would again say A, B, C, D, E, get the cervical spine in control. If you have to control the airways, generally the SR on call that goes, empower that SR to use a video laryngoscope so that they don't struggle intubating that patient. 
So whether it's a CMAC, whether it's a MIGRA that can go send your best team as the first responder. So they should have a good technician in the emergency department because that's the most uncontrolled environment for an emergency patient to be in so that your best team goes. That means best available help is there. Send a good technician in your teams. Have a video laryngoscope for good airway control. Get those patients head up, sedate, ventilate, get a good blood pressure, normal oxygen, normal carbon dioxide, have a clot control, seizure prophylaxis for the short period, keep the blood glucose normal. Don't let the glucose go down. Start thinking about ICB uh, for people who are interested in neuro as careers, because unless you talk and start, we will still not measure ICPs in our country regularly. Start to have these beds, which show you the degree of head up elevation. I keep saying head up because that's the most simple way you can become a neurosurgeon and get the ICP down in 20 minutes. And you will be surprised if you go and look at, look at patients of TBI, how poorly this is compliant on. So not many places do it regularly. People are staying lying flat when they get transferred from emergencies to ICUs or from ICUs to OTs. And there's no reason for it. The second part here, the second slide, which I put at uh, the photograph is, is for the emergency room trolley. Because there, if you have, unless you ruled out a cervical spine injury, you can't do what the image on the left shows. That means you can't bend the trolley. So you must get the whole uh, trolley up. Uh, and some trolleys will do it. Most will not. So you've got to get the trolley other way around. So in places where uh, you get prior warnings of polytrauma head injuries coming in, the ATLS trained team will get the trolley the other way around because they know the trolleys won't go up like that because they've been trying for an east to get the aspiration and head downs. So getting the trolley this way is very important if you have prior warning of an ATLS patient in which you can't break the bed and get the patient head up 30 degrees. These things are not written anywhere. But these are practical things which are very, very useful, very, very important for the dying brain, and they're very poorly done. So that's it about for me for managing this basic TBI patient. Thank you. I will unshare my screen now. Uh, thank you, Gaurav. And uh, now we proceed further, and uh, we talk about procrastination of uh, patients uh, who have had a traumatic brain injury. And uh, this will be discussed by Dr. Shalini. Dr. Shalini Nair has got a lot of interest in traumatic brain injury, so average organ donations, and uh, has been uh, using a lot of ultrasound and neurocritical care. She has uh, about 45 publications and, and chapters, and she has been, I forgot telling you, she has been trained in Toronto. Dr. Shalini, can you start now? I'm sorry for the delay and thank the organizers. This is a very important, at the same time, a difficult topic to deal with in management of uh, traumatic brain injury. That is the prognostication. Uh, I have a disclaimer to make. If the audience is looking for a quick fix for a essay type question, you're not going to get it from here. But on the other hand, if you're looking for some tips for day-to-day -day management, you may get some up your sleeve. So um, without wasting, if you were to type prognostication on Google Scholar within less than 0 .5, 0 0.05 seconds, you get more than 17,000 results. What it tells you is that there is no one uh, parameter to go by. There are multiple scales, multiple scores that have come for prognostication, but have not stood the test of time. Uh, having said that, I'll uh, try to uh, impart how important this topic is by uh, citing, an exam, uh, citing a clinical case. So in this case, there's a 27-year-old male. The age here is very significant. Four hours following a uh, road traffic accident, he reaches the healthcare facility. Now, time, we all know the first golden hour is so critical. So much can be done to help the patient. And the more it gets delayed the poorer the outcome. Now, he is a pillion rider in a two-wheeler versus four-wheeler collision. And uh, he, what, uh, the significance of being the pillion rider is to ask the specific question, what happened to the driver? The driver has passed away on site. Probably the pillion rider's impact was also quite severe. 
there is no alcohol involved and no safety helmet and this is a very important uh, not only from medical legal aspect of it but uh, also if there was a safety helmet worn the type of injury you would sustain is probably more of a sheer injury like rahul had uh, spoken about in the first uh, 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 talk um he has been taken to a local uh, government hospital so probably the abc's have been dealt with and the patient presenting to you is more or less a stable patient had two episodes of vomiting following the incidents this would tell you that there might be a probable multi organ involvement probably an aspiration there is no history of seizures or ent bleed so amount of secondary brain injury that has immediately happened after the primary insult is much less and has no medical co comorbidity now from this amount of history what we know from our scientific background is that though it was very uh, clear from age old times that increasing age results in poor outcome there has been so much of advance in medical uh, facilities available and the uh, limit of care that we have that uh, more or less the even in developing countries like india the age expectancy life expectancy has exceeded 60 so we are looking at more aged population coming with tbi and um, there was a false belief or almost a myth that probably we've done so well even at the in the elderly age group the outcome is going to be better but this is a trial came fairly recently 2018 which again looked at the impact of age on tbi and as you see the outcome worsens and mortality increases as you cross 60 so all this medical uh, advances that have made has made the 40 to 60 more more or less uh, almost similar outcomes but beyond 60 it is definitely two different dichotomies um so next when we move on to examination uh, like all, already gorov has spoken about if the airway is maintained a whole lot of trouble is been taken care of breathing is adequate uh pulse and blood pressure help you to know whether the patient is having a uh, the uh, there is a coning happening is there a neurological emergency the cushing's reflex would cause a bradycardia and hypotension then comes the glasgow coma scale score this guy is having 15 by 15 and pupils at 3 mm bilaterally equal and reacting to light the importance of this statement i will deal with a little later the power is grade 5 in all four limbs and examination of the spine shows no tenderness or deformity these two factors would be very significant if the spine is injured so in a patient with brain and spine injury assessment of power and the uh, local examination of spine would help you tell a lot about your asia grades which would then help in prognostication now from all this that we heard that we found out from a clinical examination the basic facts remain the same for many many years way back in 1993 itself we knew the uh, amount of damage hypoxia and blood pressure does to the outcome so if there is only hypoxia the uh, mortality increases the the greens which show poor outcome and increase morbidity increases if there is hypoxia the, but the uh, difference is much worse when there is hypotension and when both hypoxia and hypotension is there it dramatically increases up to 80% so that is the significance of the primary uh, management of tbi when maintaining oxygenation and blood pressure makes a big deal of difference to prognostication now glasgow coma scale score as we know in the form of uh, eye opening uh, verbal score and motor score was discovered way back in uh, 1993 or came into being in 1993 but there was a lot of uh, uh, apprehension about the flexion whether it was normal or abnormal flexion and so the uh, grading was differentiated into motor score of 3 and 4 and the way we know it was uh, kind of modified way back in 1976 so since then to almost till 2010 there was no need of any modification of tcs score itself that is a testimony 
about how significant GCS is, is in, in prognosticating, whether it is mild, moderate, or severe, and that goes on to determine the outcome. Now, why was there need to modify it at all as recent as 2010? This is because uh, if you see the circled part of the waveform, the outcome worsened when the GCS was 4 as compared to 3. Not only mortality, but also the uh, morbidity. Morbidity was worse for motor sc uh, GCS score of 4 as compared to 3. So that didn't fit into the paradigm. So what uh, in this study, what the uh, authors did was to club up both pupils and GCS. Now, pupillary examination is another very significant factor. Where if it is not only are you supposed to look at the reaction, the rate of reactivity and the size of the pupil. So all put together, that gives you a whole lot of information about uh, how the status of the uh, brain is and how it is going to be. Is there a futility of care? Should you go on to treat? And what is the uh, prognosis going to be? So when they combine the both and the fitted graph was what, what we would expect. The GCS score 3 was worse than 4, and morbidity and mortality both scored equally when the two, two parameters were fitted. So that's how a GCS P came into being, which has been found to be quite good in prognosticating. Now, whoever has practiced neurocritical care and has used the GCS score will know that there are quite a lot of pitfalls in it whether it be um, a eye score of four that is spontaneously opening eye, but then not focusing on anything. So that is a meaningless E, e score. Uh, at the same time, you may have a direct injury to the uh, eye because of your basal skull being fractured, and there both the pupils may be fixed and dilated. But at the same time, patient might be M6 obeying commands. So it is not foolproof. GCS score is not foolproof especially in a low score patient to decide whether uh, going ahead with the medical care is of any use or is it futile. Then came the four score. Now this score is very similar to GCS, but what it incorporates into it is the brainstem reflexes and the respiration. So uh, with by incorporating these two parameters, what it has done is to bring about the function of the, uh, br uh, the uh, lower cranial nerves and pons and medulla. Now, the structures as deep as the lower cranial nerves and pons and medulla, if they get disturbed functionally by a traumatic brain injury, the impact is very bad. And it is unlikely that you, you in a scenario of uh, Indian so society where the patient's family has to shell out from their own pocket with no insurance, the, the scenario of you telling the patient's family that you sell everything and invest in uh, treating this patient may not be a wise one. So that's the importance of four score. Now comes the imaging. Now, anyone who practices neurocritical care, whichever field they are from, anesthetist, non anesthetist, cannot escape not reading a CT scan. This is a whole lot of information there which helps in prognosticating. Now, I took this CT scan. Uh, which has been done of the same patient at the arrival at ED. Now, like I said before, in Indian scenario, not only is the outcome of whether the patient is going to be alive or not alive, then coming to functionally good or not good is important. But every dime the patient's relative is going to spend on uh, other investigations and uh, buying medicines and etc. for management is significant. So when you see this kind of a scan with small hemorrhagic contusions, punctate contusions in different parts of the brain, you can be fairly sure this patient is going to need multiple scans during the hospital stay. That for sure. So at that point during prognostication, you can tell them this is going to be a prolonged stay and definitely a lot of money is going to be needed for investigation, especially in a corporate setup. Having said that, our guy also was admitted, needed a repeat scan, and this has been done within 48 hours. Now, with this scan, what are you going to say to the patient? First and foremost, about uh, immediate need, there, uh, I'll show in subsequent uh, slides, there is mass effect. 
there is midline shift and the uncus is herniating. So the need for decompressive craniectomy that Gaur spoke about as a last ditch effort to make the patient survive. We are not talking about functional outcome at this point. We are only talking about whether we can keep this patient alive or not. So at this juncture with this scan, need for decompression is for sure to keep the patient alive. Now, functionally, what can you say? Well, the frontal lobe is go gone, I mean, is at least contused. And even if you don't surgically go on to chase this and remove this or do any harm to the al already injured brain, at the end of the treatment, if the patient is alive, he will have functional disability. He will have mood swings. The spectrum can vary from a very agitated patient to a completely mute patient with no emotional expression at all. That comes from the area of the brain involved. Now, coming to this left area, probably is going to be aphasic. The brokers might be involved and patient may be a global aphasia, not understanding, not speaking, or it may be just a motor aphasia, not speaking. This much probably you'll be able to tell them uh, when the scan has been done. So all this is prognostication. Prognostication is not telling whether he's going to be alive or not. All this goes on to make the family make the right decision. This is quite a bit of information to be provided to them. This is a scan only to show what is midline shift. So the where you measure the midline shift is to uh, take the midline structures within the brain, like the uh, ventricles, the interventricular uh, septum, how much has it moved from the midline? Here, for your benefit, I have measured, I have put the sagittal uh, midline scale and the coronal, how much has it moved? Around uh, 9, 9 mm. So anything beyond 5 mm, our surgical colleagues have to come into picture. They have to do a uh, surgical uh, measure to uh, kind of reduce the uh, intracranial pressure. The other very radiologically important parameter to look for to know the amount of phase ICP and need for surgery is the effacement of basal systems. So this is a uh, normal looking brain on the CT scan, and this is where there is injury bilaterally and all the ventricular spaces have gone, the third ventricle, fourth ventricle, the quadrigeminal systems, everything that should have been lying black here has been completely effaced because of the raised intracranial pressure. So this is another instance where if you delay anymore, patient may not survive. And this is probably the kind of scenario Gaurav was speaking of where you could hyperventilate till you reach the theater. Give all your anti-edema measures that is possible and hyperventilate so that you reach uh, with a probably better uh, outcome for the patient when you start surgically uh, intervening on the patient. So these are uh, factors that you could uh, tell the patient's relative that it is, an, uh, it is a life-saving measure that we are going to do. And at this juncture, we are not involved with predicting how the functional outcome is. Now, uh, moving on to what are the universal scales which are available for prognosticating? These are the two mo mostly widely popular ones. One is CRASH um, and one is the IMPACT. Now, both of these scores incorporate several measures. Uh, like I said, age, uh, the motor score, the GCS score has to be there. Then the CT scan and many of the serological markers are also involved in it. Uh, but uh, the best uh, concordance you real time has been around hovering around 50%. Now, uh, the speciality of crash is the first thing, the country where you come from, whether you are from low, lower middle income country or you are from a well-developed country, the outcome is going to change. But practically, it is good. But we have to, uh, in at least in some parts of our country, there are good health facilities available and actually clicking onto a low middle income country and bringing about a lower score or low probability of a good outcome for our patients may not be really true. And at, at the time when you are prognosticating the patient, you must remember the family is thinking of a whole lot of things, whether we should move on to some other care center, how much money we should invest in, what all property should we sell. So all this is going to depend upon what you are going to tell the family. So based on these scores, if 
if you are going to predict a poor outcome and he happens to do well is a scenario you, sh- you would want to be in so these are not full proof they can be used to give you a broader idea but then you can't go by the numbers and be rigid about it now what are the other uh, fallacies in the uh, parameters that we use for prognostication for a long long time it has been the pupils and like the title of this article says fixed and dilated pupil was kiss of death and in fact in many near centers like ours where we have a lot of pressure for turnover of turnover of bed and uh, large waiting list someone coming with a fixed dilated pupil will probably be pushed off for a better patient better likely outcome patient but then what this systematic review very recent one told was around 13% of patients with fixed dilated pupils not only survived but they also had a good glasgow outcome score which is a um, uh, kind of a peak into the functional outcome scale at 3 months and 6 months so on what ground are you going to say or you denying medical care for a patient who has fixed dilated pupils so the parameters we go about by pro- for prognostication are becoming narrow and narrow thinner and thinner so what is the way out way out is probably diligent clinical examination every hour neuro checks pupils play a way, way lot of importance but there are others like uh, looking for bradycardia or hypertension these are the clinical scenarios we have and these have to be uh, kind of blended with the multimodality monitoring that we have now how this helps is these different gadgets on the bedside not only help you to monitor what physiology is going wrong but also to implement on that abnormality and correct the physiology before it manifests into a, a sign which causes more harm to the brain so we we are moving towards a set of uh, a kind of an environment where the examination and the monitoring is going to deal with prognostication or probably in a worst scenario improve the prognosis of the patient rather than prognosticating way at the ed at the arrival and say okay you are not going to do well there is no point of admitting and treating you probably that's a that's the worst scenario we have and we should kind of move away from that and try and uh, focus towards admitting treating and then prognosticating uh, thank you very much but to go by summarizing of what i said there is no one way of prognosticating but it has to be individual approach as in the whole of medical field things are moving towards an individualistic approach here again it is that way and needs real time evaluation and the best way to go forward probably would be a clinical exam and multimodal monitoring thank you for your listening thank you dr shalini i'm uh... grateful to you for you know taking part in explaining this very important aspect of um, uh, management of traumatic brain injury which generally we miss out on uh, we are really very grateful to the your faculty dr mukul for having uh, taken such a elaborate webinar today on traumatic brain injury uh, dr rahul dr gorov dr shalini thank you so much um i thank you for discussing the pathophysiology the clinical management and the prognostication and of course the moderation by mukul